I'm Adrian Lacey. This is the Comedy Slab, uh, however you cut it. I am Adrian Lacey in the southeast of England. He is Shane O'Connor in the Midlands. And collectively, we put different comedies on the slab of the title. And uh, if you're not familiar with the show, special welcome uh, along. And um, we have this virtual marble slab, I guess. And um, we put a different show each week, uh, be it TV, radio or call it collectively digital podcast, however it comes. And um, we prodded about a bit. We get our scalpels onto it, see what we make of it. And then at the end of the show, we give it a score out of five each. And we top that up to a score out of ten. It is that straightforward. Uh, and you can play along at home or wherever you are in the office on the move. It's that straightforward. So... Um, in a moment, we are going to put on said comedy slab a BBC radio show called Bristow, or at least that's the series title. And we're going for series two, episode one. There were four in uh, that series. We're going for the very first. And the uh, series subtitle is When Melancholy Autumn Comes to Chester Perry. Um, we'll get into more detail, of course, in a while, but uh, it, uh, it comes from a comic strip. So that's an interesting um, genesis, a way to start out uh, for a radio show. But before we do that, we like to um, give you a bit of comedy news. I say we like to. Actually, we don't like giving sad news. But I'm afraid, uh, Shane, you've got some sad news about someone else. We've lost a talented individual. Yeah, well, one of, one of my favourites, I quite liked him, uh, the comedian, I mean, they're describing him here as the 70s comedian, Dougie Brown, and, and I mean, it's fair play to say that that was um, his heyday. Um, he was um, he was quite prominent on um, the comedians, the show, the stand-up show, mm. uh, and the Will Tappers and Shunters Social Club, who we very often reference by saying, now, now, come on, everybody, settle down now, settle down, that kind of... Uh, Colin, what was his name? Colin Crompton. Oh, right, because uh, in my head I've fused the two together, but it is an awful long time ago. They're two separate shows, are they? Because I thought the uh, Shuttle Down was uh, in The Comedians, but obviously isn't. The Comedians, no, The Comedians was quite, I think it was quite pioneering it for its time. Mm. It was just basically, you'd cut to a comedian, he'd tell a gag, you'd then cut to the next comedian and they'd tell a gag, and then you'd cut to the next comedian and they'd tell a gag, and it was just that, the whole, the whole show. Oh, gosh. Again, I didn't remember it that way, but it's about mm -hmm. half a century or so ago. Um, I thought they did their, their act uh, and took it in turns, but um, intercutting, as you're saying. Yeah, but no, sad to say that at 82, uh, Dougie Brown has uh, has left us to go and play the uh, the great uh, comedic comedy club in the sky. I thought he was a great actor. He did, um, it, like his sister, his sister was Lynn Perry, who some people will know as Ivy Tilsley in Coronation Street, mm. who was... Um, uh, in it for for quite a while actually for for quite a number of years and a very central character, um, but um, yeah he he, he did uh, I think he he was in Still Open All Hours I think he did a bit in that and I'm sure he did some stuff in The Last of Some Wine I'd have to look up, but um, one of the great contemporaries of uh, of people like uh, Barry Cry you know who mm. who kind of went through and Chris Emmett and Ted Rogers and Tommy Cannon and Bobby Ball and all those kind of people so. Um, yeah, part part of our seventies. I know we like to decry the seventies as a a terrible time when awful comedians roam the earth. But um, um, if you weren't there, then don't comment because you're talking at your at. Um, but yes, so sorry to see uh, Dougie Dougie Brown died at the age of eighty two. Mm. Uh, rest his soul. Um, I was just looking at um, his uh, wiki page because I'm not as clued in as you on that. I, I recognise his picture. Um, but uh, I see he was uh, on... I've just lost the line now. Oh, come back to me. Oh, yes. Uh, did you mention Last of the Summer Wine? I thought he had. No, mm. I, did, I, I said I thought he'd been in Last of the Summer Wine. I hadn't read that. But from memory, it, was he in that then? He was. Uh, it's what it's saying on his wiki page. Also, Peak Practice, yeah. Crown Court, which was a straight drama. Oh, uh, Crown Court. Yeah, fabulous. That takes you back. All Creatures Great and Small, The Bill, Minder... And uh, even he was one of the original co-hosts of the game 3-2-1 with the mighty... Well, Ted Rogers took over. I'm not sure whether he was with him uh, in that. So, yeah, uh, uh, interesting guy being able to cross the, the uh, great divide, which shouldn't be a great divide between comedy and um, straighter acting. 
yeah. So uh, we mourn his sad passing. Um, Jerry Sadowitz is very much with us, but um, his show isn't. Did you catch up with this story? This comes from the um, Edinburgh Festival. I saw I saw a, a tweet which kind of alluded to the fact that it was another one of the another uh, cancellations of our lifetime. And I'd be honest with you, I kind of skipped over it as. Um, Cancellation fatigue, you know. I kind of think I just, I just kind of had enough of You've this. Just cancelled the cancellation. It's... Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can bring an extra twist to it, uh, having been on the same bill as Jerry Sadowitz. Um, this is back in the dark ages, of course. Um, and uh, what I call the great white heat of the alternative comedy revolution. Um, strange enough, I didn't stay. In. <laughs> I think the white heat burnt me up. But um, I found him hilarious. I haven't seen him. Uh, in live in a live stand-up um, context since then uh, and this we are talking over 30 years ago and of course tastes have changed but no one who'd done the most minimal amount of research could think you could put him on children's BBC and get away with it he was never going to be an, uh, an easy listen or easy watch um, so I should tell the story just quickly. I, I'm reading from The Guardian here. Uh, it, 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 it has got quite a bit of uh, pickup, or it did uh, a couple of weeks or so ago. Um, Jerry Sandowitz is, as well as being a stand-up comic, he's also a magician. He had a TV he's show. He's very good. Very good magician as well, isn't he? From by all accounts, from one. So I've heard, but strange enough, I've I've barely seen his comedy. Actually, I think no. Sorry, uh, I haven't seen it live, but. I was just about to say, do you remember a BBC Two show he did called The Paul Bearer's Review? No. Well, by BBC Two standards, this was pushing right at the edge. And the opening titles had people hanging. So, you again, you immediately knew you weren't in for an easy ride that your, your gran was necessarily going to enjoy, uh, if that's not too patronising, or, or that you should let the kids watch. So, you know, definitely at the dangerous end of comedy... Hmm. But uh, he had a show on as part of the Edinburgh Fringe and it was at the Pleasance Theatre. And uh, I think he was only going to do a run of literally two, he did the first night, and then it was the venue that pulled the plugs on it. And to me, that's the slightly unusual thing. They claim there were some walkouts. Jerry Sadowitz, I think it was in his own tweet or in his own comment, he said he didn't see any walkout. So you've got his word against their word. Um, but a lot of it is, um, well, yeah, he did use the P word, which I'm not going to excuse. Um, but, you know, he didn't ask my permission either. And, and it is legal. I mean, we can debate whether it should be illegal. Um, in a comedy context, understood as a joke, as far as I know, that wouldn't, I don't know of any precedent where that's counted as, say, hate speech or racially aggravated la-la-la. Anyway, um, someone had a go at him calling him a, a, a white guy and then a, the Guardian journalist writing about it said, well, they, they haven't done their homework because he's a Jew. Um, uh, can he be white and Jewish? I don't know. But anyway, I remember him referring to his Jewishness. I, you could... You, I mean, the the, the, um, the get out of jail free thing might be that you consider the whole thing, even though he's using, as far as I know, his real name on stage, you could consider that a fictional character. He's playing a character. He's playing a hateful, um, angry character. Just quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to you for any further thoughts if you're not totally cancelled by now. But I remember him turning side on on the stage pushing back his huge mane of black hair, which is still suspiciously black at the age of 60, bless him. Um, and, and he referred to his own nose in a, a, a pejorative uh, sense, connecting it with his Jewishness, which mm. would certainly be offensive from a non-Jew, um, but it's him doing it to himself. And I think, and that memory just stays with me. And it, it's, it's come back reading this article because, you know, you might say, well, he's having a go at this, that and the other group. He's having a go at himself uh, and it's self-loathing. But, I mean, could that excuse it in your book or does it not worry you anyway? 
I, I've got no idea. I, I, I'm honest. No, I'm not. I seriously have no idea. I mean, aside from being so fatigued by all of this, mm. um, I don't really understand the rules. And I think I think there's an awful lot of pandering to people um, who shouldn't be pandered to. Let me draw, I'll give you, and I say this to my wife an awful lot because mm. she worked in the business as well. And I'll give you a radio analogy. Mm. Um, <clears throat> when you were years ago you know when there were big radio phone-ins <clears throat> and you'd listen to a radio phone and i'm talking to, i'm talking to adrian but i'm talking to you listening to this podcast as well you'd listen to a radio phone-in whether you're in the united states or new zealand or australia or the uk or anywhere in europe the same rules apply you'd be listening to a radio phone-in and they would put callers to air and there was there was a, a call them what you were a telephonist a producer who would talk to those people before they put them on air, and evaluate whether they were stable, um, whether they were going to add anything of value, try and evaluate whether they were going to be offensive, um, um, you know, whether they'd share ladies' parts and put the phone down and all this sort of stuff before. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever it was. I so, and, and somebody said they were going on about social media. Social media is great because it gives everybody a voice. And I'm afraid... Everybody shouldn't have a voice. That's the sad <laughs> news that I'm here to tell you. And the reason that those telephonists or producers or whatever you call was to determine... It's, it's quality that, control, isn't it? Yeah, that everybody didn't have a voice. That, that's what they were there for. Mm. And I think we've lost life's producers or telephonists, and I think that's why we're in this mess now. I think we pander to people. It, it's complicated. What I was going to go on to say was, I don't want to live in a country that's irony-free, so that if someone comes on stage and says one thing, that, that everyone or the, the, the venue thinks, oh, they've said that, they can't say that, and closes the show, um, when actually they mean the very opposite. Um, you know, we touched on... Um, Alf Garnett last week, uh, uh, just in passing, and um, the whole point was that was ironic. Anyway, let's park it there um, and move to our slabbing of Bristow, the BBC radio show, which has come from a comic strip which we learnt last week, uh, Shane, that you're familiar with. Mm, yeah, but it's Birmingham in the mouth for me. But as you rightly said, um, uh, the London Evening Standard, or whatever it was yeah. called at the time, um, because my brother moved to to uh, to London and uh, worked and uh, he worked in the West End, but he lived in North London, and so I used to see it there as well. So yeah, I kind of oh, you got Bristow here as well in in uh, in them thar London. Were they uh, were they in sync by any chance, or didn't you get to see? I don't think they were. I don't think they were. I can't rightly remember, but I don't think they were because it, it, one of the things about Bristow is the comic the comic strip was that you could kind of pick it up. It was just within it was in the confines of that strip, wasn't it? It wasn't kind of connected as it, it didn't it didn't, oh, self it didn't go stories. Up. Yeah, yeah i didn't i missed last week so i don't know what's going on now <laughs> oh i'll never I'll never catch up the papers why is he growing that moustache i don't know <laughs> who's the tea lady this week you know it's that it's not that kind of thing is it so uh, yeah but yeah no very very much so. so and i was aware of the radio series as well had you heard any of the radio series yeah 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 um very long time ago and kind of just put it in my collection and Forgot about it. In fact, I think I had it on. Um, do you remember the the BBC used to make cassettes of? Uh, Gosh, yes. Uh, co I've got comedies. I've and, got one or two. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, I think I've still got the cassette actually somewhere. But yeah, it's a BBC cassette that I had mine on, which was like you'd get an episode on the side, wouldn't you? Sort of yeah. thing. So uh, yeah, them's were the days. Like. Um, there's anyway mm. uh, enough reminiscence, uh, particularly on audio formats. Uh, if you can ever have enough uh, talk of that. Um, what we do in the show uh, each week is play you two audio clips of said show that's on the slab. And what do I need to do by way of a scene set? Well, I'm stealing, as I so often do, steal from the best, if you're going to steal. Uh, I'm stealing Shane's idea, your idea, Shane, of uh, taking the first clip close to the beginning of the show. Um, and this is... Series 2, Episode 1, is that right? I forgot that right. It is, isn't it? Um, so we're at the beginning of a new series, and uh, I'm sure, as we do each week, we, they wanted to keep uh, on board new listeners who might just have chanced across it. So essentially, Bristow, 
uh, is who you hear at the top, and he sort of sets the scene rather, rather nicely for us. Uh, essentially, an uh, office buying clerk. It's a sort of every man stroke, every person type character who, well, let's face it, a lot of people, uh, particularly in those days, buying papers and sitting on trains, uh, long pre-COVID. Uh, and I hear rumours uh, some people do it to this very day. But um, in case you, uh, like I so often do, are working from home, I uh, just thought I'd do a scene so that some people get in these tin tubes called trains and they read papers and they chuckle to Bristow, as hopefully you will. For a buying clerk, the Christmas bonus falls like manna from the heavens above. For it is said that huge sums of money are handed out. I say it is said that, because to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever received any of these large sums, for the simple reason that Sir Reginald Chester Perry, our beloved firm's founder, has always claimed at the last minute that the company has suddenly hit a bad patch and is therefore unable to cough up the readies. Imagine my feelings, therefore, when the other day I was standing at the bookstall on the platform at East Winchley, awaiting the 8.15 commuter special, when a voice from the past caught my attention. Mr Bristow? Mm -hmm. It is Mr Bristow, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You remember me? Uh, Richard Blob. We used to work together at F&D Holdings. Of course I do. Jerry Blob, no less. How is the old firm? <laughs> Doing very nicely. Yeah. It's not much fun, though, since you left to better yourself on that rainy morning eight years ago. Uh, I suppose you realise a man of your qualities would have been chief buyer by now if you'd stayed on. Uh, 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 what do you mind if I sat down? <laughs> this bookstore is going round and round. Yeah. Did he say East Winchley? He did indeed. My dad used to chuckle at that, because my dad was one of those sitting on the trains chuckling at Bristow. And, of course, there's no right. such place, but it's the no, fact it's... that it's almost Finchley. East Finchley, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, would you, should I give you a headline so we can know where we're uh, where we're heading with all of this? Well, it seems totally appropriate with something that would be in a newspaper. So, yeah, why not a headline? Well, mine is uh, comic strip comedy stripped of comedy. <gasps> oh, that's fairly uh, uncompromising. It is, isn't it? It's uh, very succinct and um, matter of fact and to the point. <laughs> and um, any of yeah. the above. I, do you know, I, before I started listening to it, I'm thinking, will this transfer work? I can't remember, because I couldn't remember. I'd listened to it before, but I couldn't remember. Mm. Um, all I could remember was I'd listened to it, and I'd only listened to, like, kind of one episode, and then not moved on, which is unusual for me. I mean, for you, that would be another day at the office, of course, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, so true. Um, but, yeah, I kind of... I. I really quickly tired of the delivery as well, the Bristow character being kind of... <laughs> that really... By 22 minutes in, that's really got on my wick in a major way. Mm. I don't know whether that that bothered you at all. It didn't. I mean, I was aware of it, but I somehow parked it, or I... Yeah, I bought it as, you know, what I'm... I, I'm second guessing, but what I thought the actor was trying to create of a you know slightly neurotic character who's uh, you know he's always looking up, isn't he? In the, the classic sketch sense, getting a pain in the back of his neck because everyone's up there higher than him, aren't they? In the yeah, in yeah. the food chain. But can I confess to one of my um, all too frequent moments of plot blindness, or as we're putting um, radio on the slab, plot deafness? Mm. I didn't quite get why he was so out of breath, particularly on the station, at meeting that guy. I mean, there's some link there with the guy thought he, he'd gone right up the food chain and was going to get... A, but I assume it's to do with the bonus that he's anticipating. Have I got that right? I don't know. I mean, that just felt like the character was just... He, just, he was portraying him in a very panty kind of way. Um uh, not as in the garment. No, I was going to say we had in... conical bras from Madonna last week and panties last this week. week. No, it's panties <laughs> this week. But but I mean, it's bra and panties. That's, it's the bra and panties podcast, isn't it? But <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't. I I don't know. I just it kind of really it really pulled my attention in the direction it. it shouldn't have done really i mean this is one of the dangers adrian i've got to say and i don't know whether you felt this as well but i kind of when you're 
and I've had this with uh, Charlie Brown, the Peanuts, Charles Schultz Peanuts thing, when they made a cartoon out of that, is that when you read something, you give it your own voice. When you read it, don't you? You kind of read it in a particular way. Mm. And then, of course, when it's done in a different way, that jars completely with what's in your head and it takes you a while. It's, you, that's That, to me, is the win or lose point where you either go, yes, that's actually better than I thought it was, or, oh, I like it when I do it. Mm. Or it wasn't like that at all in my head, or why is he out of breath all the while? He never was when I read it. That's the yeah. problem, isn't it? Yeah. I think I touched on this in a different context the other week, uh, and I'm talking the world of film now. High Fidelity, which I absolutely loved as a book uh, by Nick Hornby, of course, um, and, and could see myself in it. It was just like holding up a mirror, a classic thing, you know, about a guy obsessing over reordering his record collection. Uh, and a lot of it was set near where I uh, brought up uh, uh, in Watford. It made a reference to a record shop that my sister bought Genesis Trick of the Tale in, in 1976. Right. Um, and, and then I heard, oh, they're going to make a film of it. Fantastic news. And then it was, yeah, uh, in America. And immediately I was deflated. But actually, to cut a long story short, uh, it was done really well. And it translated because it was lo-fi in the States. I thought it was going to be all glitzy in Hollywood, but it was much more indie looking. But, OK, I, I want to play a game here. I don't know if I'm even going to know the actor you might suggest. I'm throwing this at you with no notice, which is very cruel. In your head, can you think of an actor who you might have heard as you read the Bristow strip? Or now, with the benefit of hindsight? Because clearly it didn't work here, or the performance didn't, the interpretation. Can you think of anyone who you might hear in your head? I can. You'll have to bear with me because I'm going to have to... I can't think of his name immediately, and we could have a very protracted guessing game. <laughs> OK. Um, we, we might of, have to um, do that um, audio edit, like the Dissolve type thing in TV, our radio equivalent or podcast, audio podcast. I, w I would have said the closest I would have said that in my head was Bill Fraser, you know, f from Bootsy and Snudge. Oh, gosh, yes. Is that partly because of the visuals as well? It, it kind of looks... He's got that face, hasn't he, mm. you know, with, mm. and with the moustache and everything kind of thing. But, but yeah, it, to me, it was, it was somebody with, a, with a, a slower delivery, a lower intonation. Um, yeah, I, I, it was all just too light and panty for me. So, oh, there's <laughs> our panties your, again. That's a pair of panties we've had now. Yeah. That's... And a conical bra, or is it a comical bra? <laughs> I just don't know where to look. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, maybe you're right. The world is going to hell in a handcart, and you're proving it on this very I'm, saucy podcast. It's it's going to hell in the in the bra and panties. Certainly, <laughs> I mean, is it is it? So, have you got one that you? Th I knew. I mean, you were oh, do ask you know the it. other one? Can I can I just throw in another one for you mm -hmm. as well? Please do. Arthur Lowe. I thought you were going to throw in more underwear, like Tom Jones's <laughs> 1960s concerts. <laughs> Arthur Lowe, yes, uh, the wonderful Arthur Lowe. Uh, better known to uh, a generation maybe as uh, Captain Mannering in Dad's Army, of course. But um, he did do other voiceovers, uh, the Mr. Men The stories, Mr. Men, yeah. I'm not greatly yeah. mistaken. Yeah, uh, be are, Beautiful correct. voice. But you've got to be careful with that because, again, it comes back to the character being low status. Arthur Lowe might have Lowe in his name, but actually he was pompous and tended to play higher status. But if that's what you hear, that's what you hear. So there's no wrong no. answer. You asked me, and I immediately heard the man who was shush you know who to a generation. Uh, people getting, um, or, or at least watching TV ads for Schweppes. And um, after some research and a pause, uh, we found William Franklin, who actually, uh, we ended up in the same control room once. I was briefly mixing him when he was voicing a BBC um TV trailer. Yeah, right. He was he was actually he was going to be uh, the voice of Danger Mouse uh, for the uh, unbroadcast um, pilot, but uh, yeah. David Jason replaced him. Oh, usurped. Sadly, no. Yeah, sadly, no longer with us. Died at the age of eighty-one in two thousand and six. Oh. But yeah, is it so? So there we are. We're both in a situation where we're kind of thinking: oh, Is that the right voice for the mm. character? Not a good start, is it? No, I, I mean, I think I feel it less strongly than you. But um, when I realise I didn't actually find it that funny, the truth is I probably don't find the comic strip that funny, although I should research more on that. I had a quick look just to remind myself of the basics. Um, 
what I did like, um, which tickled my dad no end, um, it's, it's on the wiki page for Bristow, which refers initially, to, um, naturally enough, to the comic strip, and then it does further down, it refers to the radio show that we're, that we're mm. slabbing. But um, uh, did, do, you, do you remember those little words that the artist would write, uh, sort of his, his reactions, uh, and the example used on his, the wiki page is flinch, flinch, Nothing to do with Flinchley or Winchley. It's it's him flinching, but instead of yes. you seeing that in the face, it's actually the little words they're saying, flinch, flinch. Yeah, yeah. And um, I couldn't think of any others, but it, it made me think of Chiz Chiz uh, in the um, the old uh, schoolboy thing, Any Fool No. Um, but anyway, that's another, another comedy tale for another medium. Shall we have another audio clip? Yeah, why not? Why not? See if we can love it a bit more and try and be kind to it. Um, although, actually, my rambling sentence there, I think I possibly interrupted myself, as I so often do. Uh, just before I play this audio clip, my thoughts were less, am I falling about laughing? Because I wasn't. And and to do due justice, I felt, to this radio show, uh, I started to ask myself, is this... Uh, and and it's, I'm going beyond just what we were talking about, the, the casting of a certain actor. Do they sound like Bristow? It's more, does this show sound like the comic strip looks? And that's a wider question beyond uh, the just one actor. Um, and my first answer to myself is it's very difficult to go from one to another. And, and you know, if you ask me to adapt it even for myself to my own satisfaction... I could barely scratch the surface. So I think any radio producer taking this on or any similar job where you go from one medium to another is giving themselves quite a hard gig. Well, I noticed that the, the writing credit was was uh, um, Frank Dickens, wasn't it? It was Frank Dickens who, uh, yeah, who, yeah. who drew it and wrote it. And I do, you know, I'm kind of with you in a way that you, my thought was it's a bit like turning a load of one-liners into a script and, and seeing how you could come up with something. Because, I mean, the average comic strip that he produced contained maximum 20 words, nice. 30 words, something like that. Yeah. And so you're doing, you're all, you're doing an awful lot of writing around <laughs> that, aren't you? Yes. And and do you th but do you think this might be impossible to answer without knowing if this came from a specific strip? Um, do you think he might because of that word count? Do you think he might have merged several stories from several strips in effect? Yeah, well, certainly, certainly gags and and um, you know ruses and stratagems and all the other things that he he wants to put in there. I think yeah, probably been pulled in from various places, haven't they? Because um, mm. there just isn't enough unless you start from scratch and just kind of write say okay we're going to write it you know there's the basic premise um, you know four panels of a, of a comic strip is is where you're coming from when you're going to pad around that it's a, it's a big ask isn't it really but the mm. biggest problem for me as you rightly said was that it just failed to make you laugh mm. and for a radio comedy that's that's, that is bad, isn't it? That is not a great starting place, really. Not marvellous. I'm just wondering whether my dad would have found it uh, chuckleable. I suspect he might have been, in which case the comic... Well, you were sort of saying you did enjoy the comic strip. It's not that you didn't enjoy the original. No, no, I used to... We used to I mean, it was legendary in our house. I mean, and I don't know how much of that was, you know... It was it was comfy slippers time mm. um, in terms of you knew it, you knew the character, you knew he was going to say, "Oh, good grief!" at the end of the strip, and it's that kind of catchphrase comedy again, but but on the written page rather than um, in TV or, or radio form. But yeah, so I mean, he was a well loved character. There is a bit of mitigation here, which is there's one bit of lovely casting that made me smile immediately, uh, and I'm going to feature her in this clip now um she is well i wonder you, you might have looked up her name anyway but i wonder if you can tell me her name afterwards but she's playing the tea lady after we get a bit more intro i'm gonna tell you now because what a distinct did, but i won't but but yeah i mean but did you're, you, you're right. you recognize it and you could have named her straight away. oh instantly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay how could you not with a voice like that <laughs> well let's enjoy patricia routledge no i'm joking it's uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll let you guess, dear listener. Uh, if you're of a certain age, it, it probably helps. Here he comes. You must have smelt the pot, Mr. Briscoe. How does it feel to come back and find a nice cup of tea waiting for you? Home from home. Oh, Mrs. Purdy, you are a treasure. Mr. Hewitt was telling me about your life and death struggle with old Iron Clad <laughs> when you was a chimney sweep working mm. the tall chimneys in the days of the cotton mills. <laughs> and I was reminding him about the days when, equipped only with a Swiss army penknife, <laughs> you decided to take on Big Brown, mm. the tallest and widest tree in the Yukon, when your friend Jack London caught his foot in one of the many roots laying just beneath the covering of lights, no. Happy days long past and best forgotten. Uh, Hewitt, how good are you at judging ages? Not bad, why? I'll give out that. What do you think of the oldest? The fairy cakes or the coconut macaroons? Oh, you yeah, cheeky man. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You're being a trifle hard on her. Uh, the test of a real tea lady is that she must not only know how to take punishment, but to go on dishing it out. <laughs> do I ruin it now for everybody who didn't have a guess, or do you want me to say? Uh, I don't think you will ruin it, but yeah, please do say. The wonderful Dora Bryan. I mm. mean, just so, such a great character actress, isn't she, from, uh, from so many different films and TV shows as well. And you're right, she does lift it a little bit. Yeah. But but again, you know, her playing opposite Michael Williams, I don't, I don't know, I don't know whether it works for me. It's. Uh, I think you know it, it doesn't work, do you? No, yeah, you it's, it, it's. Do you know the other thing is as well? I I get the feeling that he's trying to make himself sound old in this. Right. I did wonder if you've seen the photo online at uh, BBC.co.uk, where sadly it's not currently available as we speak, but. Hopefully we'll come back again. I, I sense a, a certain amount of hair dye going on. I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. And who am I, an old baldy, uh, to have... Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it in judgment. Just merely, that's what I think. <laughs> hair dye envy. <laughs> yeah, but we should point out, this is 1999, uh, stroke 2000. I, I'm not sure which side of the divide, but it did cross uh, the millennial divide. Um, and I'll try not to talk about my... Book, which is around that time but you know it was quite a different world if we think that's uh, 22 23 years ago um uh, probably the tail end of the comb over as well you, you might be uh, uh, i do remember seeing one person around that time with a comb over but hey um we're not here in audio uh, to just talk about hairstyles or lack of um for me dora bryan there just to, to stay with her for a moment just a glorious richness of the voice i mean immediately i saw her face because i've seen her as you said lots of tv and film but mm. the richness of the voice it's nice to actually enjoy her without barring my mental image just to have a chance to concentrate on her voice and that has to carry it of course uh i don't know where she breathed but that was part of her skill i think being able to talk for great uh, screeds of writing uh out loud uh, reading them out loud without uh, too much of a breath and also that's part of the comedy she's one of those people or her characters run out of breath but they carry on talking anyway and i'll carry on till the end and what are you on yeah. about yeah yeah um so that was good but yeah i hear what you say i probably shouldn't um uh lengthen the agony for you too much um well, I just wanted to throw in one more um, well-known actor. Oh, feel free. Uh, uh, old Rodders, Rodney Bewes. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, bless him. Was uh, was Jones, wasn't he? In uh, mm. uh, who's who's kind of like he's he's uh, he's Bristow's colleague, but also he's kind of nemesis, isn't he? Jones, he's always kind of like winding him up and sticking the knife in and that sort of stuff. Um, but I, but I, again, I was like curious curious casting but I, I started to think about how you know he'd he'd been in the likely lads because uh, clement and frenet mm. uh billy liar thing as well um you know and he got he got sort of like bits and pieces after that but never really he never had a major role again did he he was, he was kind of a, it was almost sad to see him pop up in this because it seemed, it seemed somewhat 
beneath him. Is that is that you know the the role that he got? It was mm. a kind of bit part, wasn't it, in a way? So I, yeah. yeah. Do you think he was one of those people who paid the price for being so famous at one point, and then they couldn't? They looked like, and I'm putting this in heavy sad quotes they look like damaged goods or yesterday's person or whatever term you want to use even though you yeah. and i don't believe that uh it's just like you the, the the darker side of being popular is is what follows that is unpopularity for too many people the problem is he had he had a distinctive voice which he only ever used mm. you know he did he wasn't an accents kind of actor was he in that sense and, and, unless we unless he was never given the chance to i mean certainly i haven't heard anything that wasn't what we've just heard there, really. No, and the problem is, as soon as he opens his mouth, you think there's Bob, mm. uh, and it, and the trouble with the trouble with the Lightly Lads is that you know um, I know the Lightly Lads only lasted for two years, and then whatever happened to the Lightly Lads was another was that another three or four years, I think something like that. Mm. But the shadow that it casts is immense, isn't it? Mm. You know, and and. I don't know that's what did his legs at the end, really, is that, you know, he's sitting there and he's trying to get out from underneath of Bob Ferris yeah. all the while. But it, it, like I say, it was I kind of, I always I always thought of him as as an actor of some standing, nonetheless, and it just seemed a little bit sad that that's, you know, who's doing it. But it's work, isn't it? It's work. That's what actors do. You know, yeah. They, they act. Yeah. I heard um, the guy who plays Brian in The Archers, and I'm not au fait enough with the archers uh, to remember his name, but he, he just seemed so grateful to have had steady work. But even then, every time he opens a script, he worries that might be the last one. I think he was saying. Yes, yeah. Where's uh, that tractor going? Who's, who's, yeah, who's, who's, yeah or his, a... ca his character was given a, a plane at one stage. You think, oh, that's really interesting. I might be able to do something with that. And then he thought, it's not going to kill me, is it? He had to ask yeah. the right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does anybody want to put a railing on that bailing machine? Because uh, <laughs> somebody could have a nasty nick off that. If we don't yeah. yeah, tough old gig. Uh, who'd yeah. be an actor? Um, obviously quite a few people, and that is part of the problem. The, the work is diluted. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, it's the old pyramid. There's some of the people get uh, a vast amount of the proportion of the work. Although, I have to say, you know, when we're surfing the internet for comedy news and we go to comedy.co.uk and Chortle and all this, the thing that strikes me all the while mm. is all these little pop-up adverts for tours and for, uh, you know, and I have three or four, five, six unknown comedians on there. And the other thing that always strikes me is how many comedians are on the circuit now. Mm. I mean, it's it. It must be just. I mean, if you're if you're at the top, you must be always thinking, "Oh God, how long am I going to be here?" And if you're at the bottom, you're thinking, "Am I ever going to get out of this and get higher up?" You know, yeah. and and everywhere in between, you're probably just as just as uh, insecure. But there are so many actors, so many uh, comedians these days. Um, you know, trying to trying to do their thing and, and, and move it forward. Yeah, bigger even than uh, I remember it again uh, in all, uh, the age of alternative comedy back in yes. the 80s. And that seemed yeah. quite busy. Okay, so we can put it off uh, no longer. I've got a feeling you're not going to get into double figures. Oh, hang on, we never do if you're scoring out of five. But <laughs> um, I've got a feeling it's not going to get beyond 50%. Okay. Do you want me to go first? Don't have to, because I seem to remember me fudging it and hiding behind your coattails last week. I'm going to give it... I'm going straight down the middle for a two and a half, which is actually the same as uh, last week for me. Um, okay. I can't be too unkind. I haven't mentioned the music, which I thought worked really well, but actually uh, it also reminds me, it was a Christmas... Um, well, it, it was a variation, a recurring variation of God Rest Ye Merry, the reference to the bonus or lack of bonus at the end of the year. I wonder if it went out at Christmas, but... Um, um, did you at least enjoy the the jazzy music just very quickly in the in between scenes? I think the, the best thing about it was the boom, ding, 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 <laughs> yeah, ding, as you've demonstrated ding, ding. a nice upright upright bass. Yeah. Um, anyway, so if I was scoring the music, it'd be closer to five. But yeah, two and a half out of five uh, for me. Don't want to be nasty about it. Uh, 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 I wonder if either of us would take it on as a gig if we were offered it, you know, convert this comic strip that you have got some fond memories of. Um, tough gig and possibly a poison chalice. For me, um, it's a one and a half, I'm afraid. Mm. I know. Um, I, I really wanted to love it. I wanted to just even like it. But um, 
I just couldn't find anything in this. I mean, you know, despite the fact you've got Dora Bryan in there mm-hmm. and uh, Rodney Bewes, I just couldn't find anything to redeem it. It wasn't funny. Um, it wasn't clever. Um, it didn't do anything that raised it above that for me, really. So, yeah, sadly, one and a half with a heavy heart. Mm. So four out of ten for Bristow. So it didn't make the, uh, the, the halfway mark. The and, halfway and it's line. It's possible with... With the, the history you have with the comic strip, that uh, your higher hopes mean that uh, hopes are more dashed, they've fallen even exactly. further. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, what have you got for me in return, and us, indeed, the listenership of the Comedy Slab for next week's homework? Well, not so much what have I got, but what has uh, Morris got for us? Morris Balm, who's um, a follower of the Comedy Slab on Facebook, uh, sent us a note and uh, what a great way and, and it's, not, it's not Morris it's Morris M-O-R-U-S okay. so uh, Morris Baum Baum or Baum B-A-U-M I never know whether to say Baum or Baum I would have thought Baum but I could be wrong uh, but either way on Facebook Morris sent us a note and said um, he loves the comedy slab which is really kind of some really kind words he also said I'm not sure if you do animated stuff and, I, and I, uh, he said have you ever done Bob's Burgers <laughs> I've never um, heard of it, never mind having done it. I might have eaten well, a few. We did, we did Archer, if you remember, Archer was an animated series, wasn't it? And didn't we, have we done Family Guy? I can't remember if we've done we Family Guy. We haven't, that should be, uh, put that in the list. But um, Archer, I vaguely there. remember, yeah. He was a special agent, wasn't he? He was very adult, wasn't it, that one? Was but, it a uh, bit Lara Croft-like? Not that I've ever seen a full Lara Croft or... He's kind of a bit James Bondy, but right. uh, but yeah, he was, he was that kind of guy. But anyway, so mm. I said I said to him, yeah, yeah, but good call, Bob's Burgers, uh, because it's one that I'm kind of vaguely aware of. Are you do you know it? No, no. Okay, it's kind of slightly invading my consciousness, but not very much. Um, and uh, it's been going for about twelve series, I think. So at least because that's one of the series that we're we're looking at an episode from series twelve. Um, and uh, I thought, yeah, let's whack it on the slab. So thanks for that, Morris. Uh, series 12, episode one, Bob's Burgers, is what we're going to be looking at next week. Do you want the episode name or are you not bothered? Oh, no, I always prefer that the more information, the better. You can throw it away, but you can't create it. You can't make it it's, up. It's, it's, <laughs> you would do, wouldn't you? It's called uh, Manic Pixie Crap Show. <laughs> And can I just double check I heard correctly? My my ears did a double take, if ears can do that. Did you say mm. 12, this is series 12? 12, yeah, series 12. Not episode, not episode one, 12, but series 12. No, series 12, and you've missed the whole lot of it. And it didn't, I didn't even see it driving by Bob's Burgers. I imagine it's a van, but I could be wrong. Well, we'll find out. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. So there's no good asking me or fishing for, for little <laughs> hints or clues. You're going to have to sit and watch it, mate. There's no, no question. Well, there. I will look forward to it. Um, and a huge thanks to Morris for widening both of our horizons. Uh, well, that's assuming we we like it. Or even if you, even if we don't like it, I guess you have succeeded. You're, in... you're still, it's still widened, isn't it, whether you like it or not? Yes. So... Bob's Burgers. Uh, make sure you're hungry for that next week. Yes. Yeah. Um, OK, well, on Twitter, we are at uh, Comedy Slab. Do follow us there. We're very discriminating in what we tweet or retweet. The occasional um, backward flip of a cat. I just can't resist. I'm a bit of a uh, cataholic. But, uh, you know, I think it's um, it's not full developed catatonia. That's just in the margins. Um, but if we see a nice gag, especially if there's a bit of footage of my famous cousin, Ron, as uh, the the baby eating bishop of bath and wells in blackadder well you know i've been dining out on that for 40 years i intend on to uh, carry on doing so um so that's uh, that's twitter at comedy slab same handle uh on the platform that morris uh, mercifully and wonderfully found namely facebook we are at comedy slab there too uh if you'd like to say nice things about us and why wouldn't you on apple podcast or itunes a uh, nice generous star rating and a nice bit of blurb there as well that would be wonderful and if you ever get to meet people in person you know eyeball to eyeball or indeed over any proprietary form of uh video connection be it the zoom of doom or teams 
uh, or any of those. Uh, we are the not, scope of hype. Yes. We're, what's the term? We are um, agnostic on the platform. Yes, that's a phrase you hear in TV. Uh, platform agnostic. Uh, but uh, just get the message out and uh, thank you for doing so. Well, what an episode this week as well. I don't know about Adrian. I can't speak for him, obviously, but certainly from my point of view. I'm absolutely exhausted and spent, and now it's time for me. I don't, I don't know about him, but because he has a greater threshold and tolerance for these kind of things. But this conical bra and panty set is just <laughs> killing me. I've got to get, I've got to get home and get them off as soon as I possibly can because <laughs> they're cutting in something rotten. I, I don't know whether you're you getting the same as well. Are you chafing? Oh, ter- terrible chafing. Yes, uh, I'm chafetastic, um, <laughs> and we can't wait for the rains and for the cooler weather. Um, I don't think you I want to You can't wait for Lorraine's what? <laughs> for Lorraine. <laughs> Which is French for the rain. Um, I think we'll leave it there before we get, uh, before we get cancelled for having too much um, gentlemen's and gentlewomen's underwear. <laughs>